Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lori Esquivel. I'm the Director of Operations for the Alzheimer's Association. And you are in the breakout session titled Coping with COVID-19 Crisis. I'm sorry, Coping with the COVID-19 Crisis, Caring for the Professional Caregiver. I want to remind everybody that if you have a question or comment to please use the chat feature on your screen. I'll be monitoring those and um, towards the end of Chris's presentation, we'll be reading some of those questions out loud and giving Chris an opportunity to respond. With that, I'd like to introduce and turn this over to Chris McCaffrey, who is the administrator with Northridge Alzheimer's Special Care Center. Chris, go ahead. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm guessing that I know several of you, but I can't see any of you, so um, we'll just take it on faith. Um, but I am the administrator at Northridge. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about ways that we can support um, our caregiving staff during this crisis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. For those of you who don't know me, I have been in the... Um, field of aging for some time. I, I've previously worked with the Alzheimer's Association, so Lori and I are colleagues. Um, I have also worked in the area of uh, mental health, so um, I'm going to be sort of combining my background from both of those areas to see if we can't strategize some ways to support our caregiving staff. So. I think the first thing we have to talk about is kind of setting a frame for who our long-term caregivers are. Um, the entire industry is comprised of about four and a half million workers. Um, the majority of those provide direct care. They're gonna be your direct care staff, your nurses, your caregivers, those folks, um, followed closely by other support workers. That's gonna be your kitchen aides, housekeeping, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the smallest slice, of course, is going to be more of the office and administrative staff, um, as well as social workers, etc. Um, the majority, two thirds of this uh, force works in facilities, so either nursing homes or assisted living, and then one third approximately do um, home health. They come into the uh, clients' homes to help out. So you can see that that's a pretty good chunk of, of people working in this industry. So if we drill down a little deeper, we're going to see some other demographics. The vast majority are women, uh, particularly in direct care. Um, a disproportionate share are folks of color, particularly African-Americans, comprising about a quarter of that entire workforce. Um, and again, the large majority are working for less than $30,000 a year, meaning um, they are below the poverty level. And of course, what we know now um, is that both of those factors being of color and um, poor are huge risk factors for both contracting the disease as well as dying from it. So keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward and talk about some of the risks and stressors that these folks are, are working under. All right, so in the best of circumstances, being a caregiver is really hard. And not just a family caregiver, being a professional caregiver is hard too. We know that when we look at this group, we find things like uh, risks for chronic stress, um, what we call compassion fatigue. Um, it's a form of burnout, but it's, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term, but it's the act of uh, giving to the point where you feel like you just don't have a whole lot left to give. Direct caregivers in particular are also at huge risk for injuries and other uh, physical ailments of their own, right? Transferring folks, um, sometimes being at risk if you're working with a population uh, that is aggressive or defensive or in some other way might lash out physically, you're at risk for that, um, again, as well as just on the job injuries, slip and fall, um, straining muscles from, from transferring clients, et cetera. In these closed environments in particular, um, the direct caregiver is at huge risk for being exposed to infection. So even when we're not talking about COVID, there's always the risk of MRSA and staph infections and different things like that in these environments. 
We also know caregivers are at huge risk for uh, emotional problems such as depression, uh, anxiety, and woven through all of that are sleep issues, right? So when you care for this population and you do it in a way where you're really present and available, sooner or later it starts to take its toll on your mental health, and that's just under the best of circumstances, okay? So it's a tough job. Well, when we contrast that and compare it, right, that column on the left, pre-pandemic, that's all the stuff that we just talked about. When we add into the mix a lot of the things that we are now finding during the pandemic, right, obviously the huge fear um, from working in these environments and with this population of contracting COVID yourself as a caregiver, right? I'm in the midst of a really high-risk population. Um, my, my risk for contracting the disease goes up proportionately. Some folks, um, I've heard people talking about the fact that they themselves are not concerned about getting the disease. Um, they're not worried that it'll do much to them. But even if that's the case, if they're like me, my biggest fear is I don't wanna be the guy that gives it to somebody else. That's a huge stressor that a lot of us in this industry are carrying around, not so much the worry that I'm going to get sick, but that somehow I'm going to be a spreader, right? That I'm going to pick it up somewhere off of a grocery cart at Smith's and, and bring it into my facility, right? So uh, I know that a lot of the folks I work with, that's a big fear for them, uh, even outside of work. Another huge fear is, um, again, if we look at the populations that we're talking about, and in particular, not so much the nurses or the administrators, but those direct care folks, um, and the support staff, huge fears around getting laid off or getting fired, right? A lot of them um, may have seen other industries like uh, service industries where wait staff are getting laid off because the businesses are closing. That's always kind of in the back of their mind that there is the potential um, for the job to just not be there anymore, a huge stressor. I think also a lot of people have fear that if they, um, contract the virus um, or start to show symptoms, even if they don't have COVID, other kinds of symptoms, that the organization they work for may fire them out of fear that they do have it. So there's a lot of sort of bubbling anxiety around um, job stability um, for these direct care folks right now. The other thing that, that is actually, I think, affecting everybody, uh, if you have children, is um, what are you doing right now, right? Because they, a lot of us rely on um, school as a form of childcare. And so when schools shut down and we can't bring our kids to work, particularly in these high-risk environments, um, what do you do? It's a huge stressor trying to figure out how you're going to keep your kids taken care of during the day so that you can still work and provide um, a lot of people are relying on family. I know that. Um, and I also know a lot of people don't have that. It's not a luxury they've got. They can't call up grandma and ask her to sit with, uh, with little Susie on um, Zoom school for four hours a day. So um, a ton of anxiety underlying everything about that. Again, if we look at the, the population being uh, below the poverty level, that's going to create issues around healthcare, right? A lot of these folks don't have healthcare through their work. Some of them, if they are lucky, if you want to use that term, may be qualifying for uh, Medicaid or, or other kinds of assistance. But even at that, um, when you're talking about being on ventilators and being out of work for weeks at a time and things like that, there's a ton of anxiety about, do I have appropriate healthcare right now? What happens if I do get sick? What happens if my kids get sick? What, you know, what happens, what happens, what happens? The other thing we know, again, because it is a lower income uh, industry for the direct care worker, many of them work uh, at more than one facility. They tend to work at uh, maybe two or three different nursing homes or assisted living facilities as a caregiver. And what is happening is that is slowly being whittled away, particularly as we see cases um, of positivity rates showing up in these facilities a lot of the facilities are making employees choose one place to work. So they won't allow um, the direct care staff to moonlight anymore. So on top of just the constant worry about, am I even gonna be able to keep this job? 
now I can't even work at these other places um, because I'll, I'll lose this job if I, if I do. Um, and you're all probably well aware that um, the New Mexico Department of Health as part of their efforts um, are tracking very carefully staff who work at more than one facility. They're, so it's not even, it's not even like these folks can um, sort of do that under the table. They're really under the gun to, to choose a place and stay there. But if you're, you know, if you're relying on a second or third job, that's hugely stressful and detrimental to your livelihood. So when you combine all of this, the normal stress that folks are under with all the new work-related stress that's wrapped up in the pandemic, what you've got is a huge recipe for instability, right? Um, this is even assuming you don't have staff who contract the virus and, and have to be out of work just working in these conditions under this constant stress is sooner or later going to take a toll. So, so how is it that we um, are going to support our team? How do we convey to them you're not alone in this and have that be more than just sort of a platitude or, or being trite? In other words, what can we do as leaders? And so I want to talk about some specific strategies to look at. Um, and go from there. Some ideas that, that I've seen work at, at my facility, as well as some things I've seen at other places. So the first thing as a leader um, for, for a team of staff like this that we have to do is we have to be able to recognize these signs of stress early and call them what they are, right? And, and really not sort of hope that they go away or, um, sort of put the onus on the staff person to have to talk about it and raise it and bring it up. Because again, if, if we go back to the, the slides that we looked at earlier, it's scary. It's scary to sort of talk about this stuff if you think that as a result of that, there's the potential that you could lose your job if you bring any of this stuff up, right? Everybody feels like they're on thin ice. So we have to recognize these signs in them and sort of start that dialogue in a way that um, helps them recognize it's safe. It's safe for us to talk about this stuff. Um, the first one I think that we have to really pay attention to is this, when we see in our staff people, particularly in staff that you wouldn't normally see this in, these feelings of irritation or anger or um, kind of resentments, things that, that maybe you wouldn't normally see. And I, I wanna kind of take a little detour here and just and talk about anger. So I think of anger as an emotion is sort of a, an umbrella, right? And underneath that anger umbrella, we have things like irritation, annoyance, um, frustration. Um, those would be all on the low end of the spectrum all the way up to like full-blown rage, right? But, but there's a, an entire affective array that comes under the umbrella of anger, right? So it's, it's complicated. There's, there's a lot of things that we could label as a form of anger. What we don't often think about though is that anger itself as an emotion is a secondary emotion, right? Anger is, you're never just angry. You're angry because, right? There's always a precursor. So there's an emotion that comes before anger that causes the anger. And typically what we're talking about there, the two things uh, I think that really push us into anger um, are fear, fear or threat, um, and, and some sort of shame, right? So I'll give you an example. If you are um, in your car and you're, you're driving home from work and, you know, maybe you're, you're not spaced out, you're paying attention, but maybe you're thinking about what you're going to make for dinner or whatever, and this car pulls all the way over, crosses three lanes and pulls right in front of you, misses your front bumper by about an inch, right? What is your first reaction? Well, even though I can't see any of you, my guess is that most of you are thinking your first reaction is to, to give them the universal signal for how upset you are, right? With that middle finger. But the reality is, is that isn't, that wasn't your first urge. That wasn't the first thing that you felt. When that person cut in front of you and just barely missed you, the first thing you felt, the first thing you did was go, <gasps> right? You were terrified. You thought they were going to hit you or that you were going to hit them. 
and the fear came up, right? This, my life is in danger. And then right on the heels of that was the anger, right? Anger is really powerful and we tend to use it. It tends to crop up when we feel powerless or helpless um, or again, frightened or in threat. And by threat, I don't just mean like literally physically our, our lives are in danger. Um, I can feel a threat of not being taken seriously. I can feel threatened by um, not being valued um, or by being minimized or uh, insulted in some way. Right? There's a lot of ways that I can feel threatened where I might respond with varying degrees of anger. And I'm saying all this because if we're seeing anger, if we're seeing resentment, if we're seeing irritation, we can't just sort of take it on face value, particularly during this time. I think we have to be willing to, to look a layer or two deeper and see what's underneath it. Are we looking at, um, are we looking at shame um, or threat or fear or other emotions um, that are more related to the pandemic in general and the stress that these folks are working under. And I think our willingness to see that and have conversations, open up dialogues about it and talk about it in a matter of fact sort of way, um, I think that that is um, gonna do wonders for opening the door for staff members to, to be able to do it and to be willing to do it. Um, the next thing that we would be looking at would be do, do folks seem to feel anxious or nervous? Is there a sense of uncertainty? Um, are people wondering what's coming next? Um, is there a lot of uh, gossip or rumors about what's happening at the workplace? That sort of thing. Again, if people seem to be feeling really helpless or powerless around what's happening, they sort of got this like, uh, I've just given up sort of attitude. That may be, that could, that could lead to anger and irritation and frustration. Um, as we've already talked about, folks um, often under the best of circumstances in this work can feel overtired, overwhelmed, or burnt out. Um, but during these times, we have to keep a particularly close eye on those symptoms um, and recognize that early. Earlier is always better. Uh, folks feeling sad or depressed, having difficulty concentrating or staying on task. All of these things, um, again, could happen anyway, but particularly now, because again, we have to keep in mind, they aren't just experiencing these stressors at work or because of things that are happening at work, right? If I've got kids at home and I don't have anybody to sit with them while they do Zoom school, am I thinking about that while I'm at work? Yeah, probably, right? Um, so I have to, um, as, a, as a leader, as a supervisor, I have to be aware of all of these things, that all, of, all of this, what's happening on the job, plus what's happening in their personal lives can be informing um, how they're coping and dealing right now, okay? So first, recognizing it, and then what are we gonna do about it, right? So I've got a few strategies here to talk about so overall, as a leader, our responsibilities are to minimize any sense of chaos. And that's a big ask right now for all of you as leaders. Um, because the truth is, is that we, um, we're not getting a whole ton of direction ourselves. Um, the messaging changes from day to day. Um, there's just, there's a lot of, um, a lot of information coming um, and it's, we have to take all of that and assimilate it and decide how we're in turn going to um, create a plan for folks. So what we wanna do is convey to everybody, we have a plan, right? We, we, we know what the potential is. We know what the worst case scenarios are and we have strategies in place to address that if and when it should occur, right? I'm sure all of you have already um, designed plans for, okay, if my facility develops COVID in my resident population, or if I, if I uh, have enough staff that I fall below the threshold to meet the, the ratios um, for licensing and regulations, what am I gonna do? 
right? So one, I think it's a matter of, of having those plans, but I think being very clear with everybody that you work with that, that, that you have those plans and what they are, right? Because that gives people a sense that things aren't chaotic. We're not flying by the seat of our pants, right? Um, as much as possible, we wanna have routines in place. Um, I'm gonna talk in a little bit about avoiding rigidity. So it's really a tightrope walk. There's this dialectic of having routines because routines do breed a sense of normalcy and control and safety. But if we're so adherent to a routine that we become rigid and lose sense of people as individuals and what they need as individuals, that can become problematic too. So just kind of keep that in mind as we talk that routine doesn't mean we have to be really rigid with the schedule or expectations or protocols or things like that. It just means that we are in our day-to-day -day operations and our interactions with one another, conveying a sense of, of control and uh, calm. Okay. The third one is, is remaining unflappable. And I really like this word. This, this word goes back to my time working with um, children. And one of my mentors used to, he used this phrase a lot talking about uh, unflappability and how important it was. And the difference between unflappability and calm, right? So calm, when I say, oh, we need to be calm, I think for a lot of folks, what comes to mind is this sort of like a lower tone of voice and, and no agitation and, um, and things like that. And, and that can be fine in some circumstances, but, but let's be honest, when you're in the midst of a pandemic, right? When you're in the midst of a crisis, calm isn't necessarily what you want. Unflappable means effectively, I might have a sense of urgency. I might have a sense of, you know, we need to, we need to take some steps and we need to do them now, but I'm in control. Right. And I'll give you an example. If, if you're flying in an airplane, right, and it's cruising along 30,000 feet, and all of a sudden it goes, ka right? And everybody flying like grips the armrest and clenches their jaw and they kind of look at the other people next to them, right? And there's that moment. And then what usually happens? Well, the pilot comes over and he says, oh, sorry about that, folks. We had a little air pocket there, but, uh, it should be leveling out. We might have a few more bumps over the next mile or two, but we should be fine coming in, right? And everybody goes, ah, right? And relaxes because the guy who's supposed to be in charge or the woman who's supposed to be in charge has conveyed to us, I got it. Yeah, I'm acknowledging that was, that was a rough patch there, but we've got it. We're in control, right? Because what would happen if instead that pilot came on and went, Oh my God, I don't know what that was, but y'all better buckle in, right? Everybody's going to freak out. You have chaos in the airplane. So their job is to remain unflappable, not necessarily calm, right? Some things do warrant an elevated affect or they do warrant urgency, but urgency isn't the same thing as panic, right? So overall, we want to be unflappable because anxiety is contagious, right? So if we aren't if we are anxious, then that is going to spread like wildfire through our staff and then ultimately to our residents because that's what they react to. So practically speaking, some of what we can do to minimize a sense of chaos and elevate a sense of control um, is to give employees control over what they can have control over, right? We don't have control over this, um, this virus. We can do all the safety theater we want. We can take the temperatures at the door and do the screenings and, and all the other things we want to do. But ultimately, um, we can only do so much to keep the virus at bay with the mask wearing and things like that, right? So we can't make it go away, but we can give employees um, the, the power where, where they can actually have it to implement things. So, some of what's really effective is to create committees uh, at this time, right? Like what can employees do? Many of you probably have um, quality improvement or quality assurance committees, um, having staff members who are active participants in those to help develop safety plans, um, to stay informed with other employees around what's happening. Um, that can be very powerful creating um, committees for morale, 
right? Putting together staff committees um, whose job it is, is to come up with ideas for ways to keep morale up in the workplace or celebrate birthdays or help connect uh, employees to um, outside resources. Anything that sort of gives them uh, a sense of purpose and control um, in an environment where they often don't feel like they have a ton of control, that could be really powerful to decreasing that sense of chaos. You can also um, identify more seasoned staff members who can become mentors to, to others. You can give them very specific kinds of job responsibilities around um, teaching people the way of, you know, at my facility, for example, we have the, this is the Northridge way. This is what we do here. These are the expectations for people who work here. And so some of the folks who have been there longer and are more seasoned um, are, are um, much better suited than I to convey that information and to coach and mentor people about what that looks like. That can give people a real sense of power and control too. Um, identifying staff who can be liaisons with family members, right? I know sometimes we have to be thoughtful about that, but again, almost every facility is going to have staff who are more seasoned, uh, who have been there longer, who know how to do this appropriately and giving them the role of communicating with family members about what's happening or how residents are doing or um, what might be needed in the facility, that kind of thing. So just creating other um, opportunities for employees to feel like they are in a position of some sort of power or control can be extremely beneficial in minimizing that sense of chaos. All right, the other thing that I think is really important is validation, right? So when I talked before about um, being unflappable, in no way was I meaning to imply that we have to be dishonest, right? Um, people are frightened and frankly, they ought to be. A lot of them probably um, really are um, one bad day away from not being employed anymore or one paycheck away from not being able to take care of their bills. So this all has to be normalized, right? If people are expressing um, fear and anxiety, I know that the urge oftentimes is to sort of downplay that and, and reassure people by saying, oh, things aren't that bad or, or, th or whatnot. But I think it's really important to normalize the experience they're having and to validate the experience they're having. Um, and to, again, not to, and I'm not saying that we need to say, yeah, I'd be scared if I was you too. You're, you're probably one bad day away from, from really losing everything. I'm not saying that, but I do think it's important to validate and normalize as in, yes, I can see why you feel that way. It must be really scary um, right now to, to not have somebody to be at home with your kids during school or, right? But, but to not completely sidestep it or downplay it, I think is critically important. It makes, it makes employees feel heard uh, and it, it keeps them from feeling gaslit, right? If, I, if I'm feeling frightened um, or like things are, are skewing out of control and everybody around me is saying, no, no, I don't think that's happening, right? That's, that is really unnerving. Um, you're not ever going to get your team to a place where, where things are de-escalated if everybody's sort of walking around feeling like either they think they're crazy because they're the only ones having the experience um, or else everybody is, is gaslighting them, right? So I, I do think it's important to validate the experience, normalize that for them, okay? Uh, it allows for more honest conversations about what their concerns are. And, and part of that has to be our willingness to allow that conversation too, to open the door to it, to be available to have it. Um, yeah, I, just, I think that that's really critical. I think the other thing is being willing to provide uh, uh, information in as timely a manner as possible and to provide accurate information. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of uh, inaccuracies. And so we have to really be on point with in a very timely manner, giving people all the newest information that we have. I think it can also be powerful to share our own uh, fears or concerns if we have them. Again, 
we we have to walk that tightrope of balancing um you know what's appropriate not maybe not oversharing our personal lives or things like that but again it's helpful to validate for other people yeah i i have fears of my own right i have kids of my own i have a life outside of here too and this is impacting me and the way i see the world and and you know, um, we all have fears and anxieties about this. So it's a way of sort of empathizing and normalizing, again, the experience that they're having. Um, the other thing is that um, while we do want to validate people's fears uh, and, their, and their experiences, we definitely want to discourage any kind of rumor mongering or gossip or things like that, um, because that just creates more of the chaos that we were talking about before. Okay. That brings us to our next um, area, which I think is really critical, and that's to over communicate. So we talk about communicating and how important communication is. Um, I think during this time, during these types of situations, over communication, we need to err on the side of communicating more, right? Because, oh, hang on a second. Okay, so I'm guessing most of you just then were wondering what I did, where I went. And I'm betting that most of you also filled in the blanks. You saw something, you didn't have information and you thought to yourself, I wonder if somebody's at his door? Did he have something on the stove? Did he just really have to go to the bathroom? What was going on there, right? But you, in some way, an event happened, you didn't have all the information and so you filled in the blanks. That is human nature. That's what we do, right? We can't allow people to do that. Or rather, I should say, we, we owe it to them to not put them in a situation where they feel like that's the only option they have. In other words, if we don't give them information, they'll fill in the information themselves. The problem is, is that more often than not, they will probably fill it in incorrectly which leads to what we were talking about before, rumors and gossip and fear and anxiety and things like that. So I, I really do think at this time, it's critical that we are always aware of, am I leaving blanks? Am I, am I creating a situation, a vacuum that people are going to fill in with their own misinformation or with their own myths or with their own fears um, in a way that's gonna be stressful for them and, um, impactful in a negative way on the work environment and the team that I'm trying to create. So it's important to um, maintain opportunities to communicate through, of course, staff meetings, um, group texts and emails, um, really trying to include all members of your team in any decisions, um, what we're thinking, why we're thinking it. Um, I know that sometimes it feels like we have to be really thoughtful about what information we share. Um, but the truth is, is that at, during these times, I think having more information is way less destructive and problematic than not having enough. Again, we wanna be timely and accurate with our sharing and our communication um, as timely as we can be. Um, and, and I think this is also a good time to create opportunities to just check in with people one-on-one -on -one, um, so that you are not only creating another, yet another opportunity to communicate and share with them, but again, you're creating that, you're opening that door for them to be able to share with you and communicate with you uh, so that you have accurate information. Okay. Lori, how am I doing? I have about half an hour. Yes, Chris, it's about 2.20 right now. Okay. All right. The next thing um, I want to talk about is ways to create a more kind of resilient culture, right? I think the, the uh, organizations that get through this time are going to be the ones that are the most resilient. Um, when I worked with children, there was a belief and a lot of conversations back then about resiliency. Um, and, and we talked about resiliency as if it were just a um, kind of 
a random trait that some people were blessed with and others maybe not. And some people were just more resilient. But what we came to realize, um, and the studies bore this out, was like any other um, skill set, resiliency is learned. Children who are resilient, people who are resilient, um, it isn't just the luck of the draw, right? The, uh, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps gods didn't just roll the dice and decide to give these people resiliency, but not these ones. People who are resilient have been taught to be. And the way they're taught to be resilient is by being shown empathy and by being shown um, how to problem solve and work through adversity, okay? So when a little kid falls down and skins his knee, what do we do? Well, hopefully we don't say, oh, stop your crying, get up. You gotta learn some resiliency, knock it off, right? What we do is we say, oh my gosh, come here, come sit down, let me look at that. Ooh, yeah, I bet that hurts, right? Let's get a Band-Aid on that, and, and, right? And what we're doing in, in that sort of supportive, empathic position is showing one that, again, we're validating that, yes, that was, that was a tumble. That looks like it hurt and you're gonna be okay, right? Yes, you had your experience. I'm not gonna tell you you didn't. And guess what? We're gonna we're gonna talk about ways for you to get through that. So this idea of resiliency and building a resilient team, it isn't just gonna happen. And you, you're not just gonna have, well, some people are resilient and some are. This is something we can really cultivate and build um, through some, some pretty specific strategies, right? So one, we have to be okay with and encourage people to be okay with asking for help, right? Asking for help isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. And the more I am able and willing to do that, the more resilient I, I'm gonna be as an individual, right? Because guess what? Every time I ask for help, what am I doing? I'm building my knowledge base. I'm learning new skill sets. I'm figuring out how I'm gonna get through this problem that I'm needing help with on my own the next time. And because somebody cared enough to show me how to do it, how to help me when I asked for it, I can do that to people coming up behind me, right? And so you're building this resiliency through the entire team, through our willingness to encourage them, to um, not let people say, oh no, I don't need help, no, I got it. No, that's not gonna work these days. We really are all in this together. We really do have to be able to ask for and offer help to other people. So really making that safe, um, that asking for help isn't gonna get somebody in trouble or, or be problematic. It really is the way to um, strengthen our team going forward. We also want to really encourage and endorse um, people taking care of themselves, right? It's okay to say, I need a break. I'm overwhelmed right now, right? I would rather have somebody say, I'm feeling completely overwhelmed. I need to go outside for 20 minutes. I would much rather have them do that than call in sick for two days because they don't feel acknowledged or, um, or like it's safe for them to have to need to take a break. So they need two days to recover from whatever event um, was stressing them out to begin with. So being willing to have conversations around what people need, um, and, and dialogue around that. I'm not, just, I'm not saying everybody gets to just walk out and take a break at the same time whenever they want, but we do want for people to feel like if I need this, I can ask for it or whatever else it is I need to take care of myself. I think we also need to normalize the need um, for support around emotional and mental health issues. Uh, right when all this started, I think it was, I think it was HBO they were running a campaign with a lot of the celebrities from their TV shows. Um, it's okay to not be okay. I don't know if any of you saw that, but it was these celebrities basically giving permission for all of us to go, this is awful, this is terrifying. I'm all stressed out and I don't feel okay, right? And to, to get the message that, yeah, I bet it's not, it's not okay. And it's okay that you're not okay right now. You will be soon, but if you're not, that's okay. We have to really, again, acknowledge and normalize that during this time, your job is stressful any day of the week in good times, 
right now it's even more stressful and you've got all the stress of your personal life piled on top of it too. So um, it would be normal. In fact, it would be abnormal for you to not need some help or support. It would be abnormal for you to not be stressed out. It would be abnormal for you to not be somewhat depressed or worried, right? So really normalizing that again to validate the experience they're having, but also to give them permission if they do need help beyond what they're going to get from the support at work, you know, do they need to talk to a counselor? Do they need to find a support group? Um, whatever it is, the more we can sort of set a tone and create a culture that not only normalizes that, but encourages that as part of the self-care that we were just talking about, that's going to be really critical. Okay. Um, we also want to really sort of overtly demonstrate that we are taking measures um, to create an environment at work that is safe, physically, emotionally, um, everything, right? That, that this is not a place where you live under threat. Nobody is interested in figuring out ways to take your job away from you. Um, we care that the environment is physically safe, that you're not going to get hurt while you're here. And so again, going back to what we talked about earlier, creating safety committees that uh, employees can participate in. That's a great way to sort of over demonstrate um, the willingness to, to take safety measures and create that space. Um, not allowing um, gossip, not allowing um, rumors, not allowing threatening language amongst staff, those kinds of things really making it overtly clear that this is a place that you don't, you don't have to live in threat because we've already established, right? That if I'm working under threat and I feel unsafe, what's gonna come right on the heels of that? Anger, resentment, frustration, um, all the things that are so corrosive to a work environment. So the more um, clearly I can demonstrate and verbalize regularly um, the fact that this is an environment where it's okay to talk about. It doesn't mean you can talk about your needs and you'll be safe. It doesn't mean that I can accommodate every one of your needs, right? You might say, I need to take a month off with pay. Well, I can't necessarily accommodate that, um, but it's a safe enough place for you to, to talk about it if that's what you feel like you need to talk about. Does that make sense? Um, I think the other thing that really creates resiliency is um, having fun. <laughs> Right, having a foundation of pleasant experiences together as a team. Um, some places do this all the time anyway, right? They've got a, a team of folks that socialize and that do activities together. And it's, it's really built into their culture to create fun things for staff. Um, and other places don't necessarily do that. Right now, I do think it's important that there is, there has to be something that is fun and gratifying about coming to work under all this threat that we've talked about, right? Under all these stressors and all these fears. And this can be any number of things, right? Like I said, you can have a committee that, that comes up with ideas, um, but a lot of places do things like um, not having, um, not worrying so much about the dress code during these times or having, um, incentives where you give, you catch employees doing something good. And we, we do something called rock star bucks where if anybody catches an employee doing, doing something right or doing something well or doing something above and beyond, just doing something good, they get these rock star bucks that they can trade in for, you know, different kinds of merch that we have in the office um, that maybe they wouldn't otherwise be able to get. Um, and it's, it's just a way to, to sort of make it more fun, like create challenges, like who's going to get more rock star bucks or, you know, right, friendly competition, any of that kind of stuff. You, you know, you know, your team's best, you know what they're going to respond to um, more than anybody else. But being able to, to build that in right now, I think also lends itself to resiliency. Um, I have to have something else to fall back on with the people I work with when things start to feel like too much, right? So, 
Um, another thing that's really critical for us right now is um, avoiding rigidity. Um, again, this is a, a big ask uh, for managers right now um, because it feels like we have to be really um, we have to be really clear. We have to be really consistent. We have to have the policies and procedures in place. We have to follow things. Um, and yes, uh, you know some of that is true. But when we cross the line into rigidity, it becomes really problematic because if you think about the most rigid leaders, um, if you've ever worked for one or you've ever um, interacted with somebody who is really rigid, the odds are good that you perceived that rigidity as fear, right? That they were so afraid that if they didn't sort of hold on to this um, set of rules um, that things were just going to get away from them and spin out of control. Um, and that, that can be dangerous, right? That could be dangerous in the workplace. So yes, we want to have routines. We want to have expectations. We want to have consistency. All of those things I know are important. Um, but we also have to have enough flexibility to demonstrate, again, if I'm going to truly be unflappable as a leader, I have to be nimble, right? And I have to be able to adjust and show some some flexibility to my staff, particularly now, right? If I got staff members who don't know how they're going to, um, who are doing their best to make sure that their kids are doing Zoom school um, and they call me and they can't find anybody for tomorrow and they wanna switch schedules. I have to be able to at least consider that and try to figure out a way to meet them in the middle um, to help with that, right? I want to be able to relax things that aren't related to safety, like um, if you play music in your facility, or can you change that up so that it um, feels more uplifting to, to the staff people? Again, it's got to be appropriate, but um, I don't want to be rigid around it. If you have a dress code, is there are there ways that you can relax that? Believe me, wearing jeans is not the most important thing to me right now. Right, it isn't. It is, if I've got people who are showing up and they care and they're bringing their A game and their their full hearts to the job every day, I don't care if they're doing it in jeans. And frankly, neither do any of my residents. They don't care. Right, that's not the most important thing right now. Doesn't mean that we won't go back to that. Doesn't mean that it doesn't that it's not in place for a reason or that it's not important. It's just not most important right now. And I have to be willing to individualize um, what people's needs are, right? We talk about being fair a lot of times. And fair doesn't mean that everybody gets the same thing, right? Fair means everybody gets what they need to be successful, right? And so what one person needs to be successful at work doesn't mean this person needs that too. If I don't have children, I don't require the same kind of um, flexibility with the schedule, but, I, but with that, for me to not have children doesn't mean I don't have needs, right? So my job as the leader is to identify this person's needs individually with this person's needs individually and meet people where they are and give them what they need as individuals, not just to make sure everybody gets the same thing. And going back to the over communication, the more clear I am about that, the more direct I am about that as an expectation, right? That yes, I am going to allow Chris to change his schedule in order to be home with his kid tomorrow. Doesn't mean you get to change your schedule tomorrow, but at some point you're gonna have a need that's unique to you and I'll meet that need for you when the time comes as well, right? So over communicating and showing the willingness to be individualized. Um, will go a long ways. Okay, um, so these, these last areas I wanna talk about, these are just sort of coping strategies. Surviving, surviving crisis is, is what we're talking about here. Um, and I'm stealing this stuff pretty blatantly from Dr. Marshall Linehan, who was the um, creator of dialectical behavior therapy. Um, these are, are skills that she created and developed um, to teach people who um, have, are experiencing trauma or an inability to regulate their emotions um, because they're overwhelmed by other uh, mental health issues. But I think right now these are skills that, that everybody can learn 
And so I think if we as leaders are familiar with them, not to, not to, um, not to do therapy with our staff, but just to sort of offer them as, as tools for them and strategies that they can use. Again, it shows a willingness on our part to be attuned to what their needs are and also to help offer solutions. Um, so when I talk about crisis, I'm really talking about, am I in a position right now? Am I on the verge of doing something that's gonna make things worse, right? So let's say I'm, I'm feeling really overwhelmed at work. I'm really stressed out and I am thinking about quitting. I'm thinking about walking out, right? I'm in crisis. I'm in crisis because the next decision I make is either gonna make things worse or hold the status quo. So when I'm talking about crisis, I'm talking about, am I on the verge of making things worse? And the strategies I'm talking about, all they are designed to do is make sure that I don't make things worse. So they won't necessarily make me feel better, but they will keep me from doing something to make things worse. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So surviving crisis, um, there are crisis survival skills that we talk about. Some involve um, physiological regulation. Um, so one of them is called a TIP skill, it's T-I-P. And that set stands for temperature, intense exercise and paced breathing. And so if I can change up my temperature, if I can go into the bathroom and splash cold water on my face, or if as an agency, I've got ice packs, so I can put an ice pack on the back of my neck or even just hold it in my hands. They've done studies of what happens when we lower our body temperature in that way and all of our stress hormones come down, right? It's, it's pretty fascinating but it's a really quick, almost immediate way, again, to, to keep me from escalating emotionally if I'm right on the verge of doing that. So the T would be for temperature. Intense exercise, this isn't always easy at the workplace, but doing push-ups, running in place, doing a wall sit, anything that sort of causes me to um, use up some of that excess energy and dull the edge of that, that can be really helpful. Um, again, I, I can't necessarily drop to the ground and do 20 push-ups in the middle of the office when I'm feeling stressed, but there may be other alternatives, right? There's a lot of different ways to play with that, but increasing the exercise. And then paced breathing is just that, you know, you, it's cliche. We've talked about it uh, a million times, but taking 10 deep breaths is a form of paced breathing, right? Because what it does is physiologically, it slows down my body's responses to the stress I'm feeling, right? So when I start to feel stressed, my breathing gets shallow, my heart starts beating faster. So if I deliberately take control of the physiological part of it, it also de-escalates the emotional part of it. So the whole thing of um, breathing in through the nose and holding it and then out through the mouth and doing that like five times, that can really keep somebody from making a decision that will make their situation worse, right? So being able to offer that to folks. Um, the next thing that we wanna to offer to people is strategies for addressing their vulnerabilities, right? All of us have vulnerabilities and all of us will um, react less effectively emotionally if those vulnerabilities are heightened, right? Snickers did a whole campaign around this. They called it hangry, right? When you're hangry, you, you're not yourself. And they created an, an entirely new word. Well, hunger is a vulnerability, right? I am more likely to be irritable and short and emotion-minded and make bad decisions if I'm hungry, all right? So addressing that as a vulnerability is gonna be important. So what Dr. Linehan came up with is something called the PLEASE skill. She loved her acronyms. So the P and the L sort of go together, but it's um, treat physical illness, right? So paying attention to my body. Am I sick? Am I feeling okay? Am I taking care of myself? Am I uh, taking medications that are prescribed to me? All this kind of stuff, right? But basically taking care of my physical self, not ignoring um, my symptoms, right? 
And uh, I'll tell you this, caregivers and particularly professional caregivers uh, are very prone to minimizing their symptoms uh, and working through not feeling well. And it creates huge vulnerabilities for them. So we wanna give them opportunities um, to not do that, to address that, right? The E is for balanced eating, right? People need to eat, they need to eat well, um, and they need to not eat junk or skip meals or things like that. It increases their vulnerability. The A is for avoiding mood altering substances, right? If I am impaired, I am less likely to be able to maintain my emotional regulation. I'm more likely to um, tantrum or make bad decisions. And this includes being hungover. So I'm not gonna uh, lecture people or patronize people around their, their choice to use uh, mood altering substances, um, but people should be aware that it, it does increase their vulnerabilities if they don't do it responsibly. The S of course is for sleep. Um, we have to get enough rest. If I'm not, I'm of course much more likely to emotion mind and making bad decisions in the middle of stress. Uh, and the E is for regular exercise, making sure that I'm taking care of myself uh, and feeling better. So just offering this as a skill to your employees to have something to, to do to address those vulnerabilities and pointing out as their leader, we all have vulnerabilities. These are ways that you can take care of that. And if there's something I could do to help, let me know. Um, and then the last area is sort of radical acceptance. Some of us have stumbled into radical acceptance uh, inadvertently in the midst of this pandemic because radical acceptance is sort of the full, full experience willingness to accept that I can't change what's happening right now, right? People who, are suffer, people who suffer most um, tend to not be able to find acceptance, right? So this pandemic is going on. And if I am railing at the universe that it's not fair, that it shouldn't be happening, that this shouldn't be occurring, that I should still be able to do this, right? These people are the most miserable because they haven't been able to sort of radically accept, here's what's happening, right? I don't have to like it. I don't have to agree with it, but I have to accept reality for what it is because to not accept reality for what it is is gonna lead me to suffer because I'm gonna be fighting against something I have absolutely no control over. So really being able to encourage that level of acceptance can um, help people to, to not suffer, right? We can't, it's gonna be painful. It's painful for all of us. None of us likes wearing masks. None of us likes not being able to go the places we wanna go. Certainly none of us likes not being able to let loved ones um, visit their family members in our facilities, right? These are all painful, painful things, but painful is different than suffering. I can experience pain, but my unwillingness to accept reality as it is, is what leads to suffering. And we wanna help our staff members avoid suffering. I can't protect them from pain, but I can teach them how to not suffer, okay? Um, the last thing I think is, is really helpful is to connect resources uh, to your staff and vice versa. There's a lot of community resources um, that could be helpful. You can feel free, of course, to share these. This is a very small list. Um, as I was researching this, there are a ton of things out there, um, but these seem to be sort of the most pertinent and relevant to the population that we're talking about right now. So the city of Albuquerque, um, has a ton of stuff around um, help with rent, food assistance, even childcare and things like that. If you have staff that are struggling with those issues. I found a site called EarthCare um, that can help with um, transportation. If folks are having a hard time getting to work, um, paying utilities, including cell phone bills, um, employee benefits, childcare, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Collaborative has a lot of resources, including support groups and even telephonic support for frontline workers. So if somebody doesn't want to go to a support group, but they just wanna maybe call anonymously and talk to somebody, the uh, NMBHC is offering uh, a call in line for frontline workers to just sort of vent and, and, and talk to people. So, and like I said, there's, there's plenty more than that. 
I hope that was helpful. I don't know, do we have questions, Lori? Yes, actually we do, Chris. Thanks so much. I think this has been helpful. We do have a question. Uh, somebody has asked that you please review the acronym PLEASE again and what each letter stands for. Okay. So it's a little tricky. Um, like I said, Dr. Linehan loved, loved, loves her acronyms. Um, and I think oftentimes shoehorned them in just to be able to make an acronym. So if you were to write PLEASE vertically, for the P, it would be in front of the P, it would say treat. Physical, the P would be for physical. And then L would be I L L N E S. So it's treat physical illness. But but essentially the, the core of it is paying attention to um, to your body, listening to symptoms, not minimizing symptoms. If you are supposed to be taking medication, take it responsibly and appropriately. Um, Take care of your, your health, take care of yourself physically. The E is for balanced eating, right? Um, and, and keep in mind, these are all sort of, um, these can be individualized too. Um, but whatever balanced eating is for you. Some people do need to eat three meals a day. Some people have to you know, eat the food that, that makes you feel available and healthy and right? Not lethargic, not sick, that kind of stuff. Um, A is for avoid mood altering substances. Um, and this could also be just use substances responsibly, right? Again, I'm not going to police what people do. I'm not going to judge what people do. But the reality is, is um, having done those things myself, I can tell you that uh, I was not always at my best when I did. I was more vulnerable to being emotional, I was more vulnerable to stress, to reacting to stress, right? So it's not my job to tell people whether to do it or not to do it, but to increase their awareness around the fact that it can create a vulnerability and I have to make decisions about whether I want that vulnerability or not. Um, the S is for sleep, um, sleep hygiene, sleep well. Um, I, I would be willing to bet money that at some point in this conference, somebody's also talking about how important sleep is to uh, keeping Alzheimer's at bay. Um, there's a lot of reasons for sleeping, um, but in the context of what we're talking about, um, it's just making sure that I'm rested enough that I'm not vulnerable to emotion, mind, and stress. And the E is for exercise. Uh, again, exercise kicks up all the good hormones, right? All of the uh, uh, dopamines and, and endorphins and the things that I want to have more of. Uh, it dulls the edge on my anxiety. It makes it so that I can sleep better when it is time to sleep. Um, and I just feel more competent, more sense of mastery. There's all kinds of things that regular exercise is gonna do for me in the context of uh, coping with stress at work and avoiding crisis. So awesome. Th thank you for that, Chris. Uh, any other questions at the moment? We have uh, come to the end of our time here, and I know some of you are anxious to get on to your next uh, breakout session, but I'll give it just another second to see if there's any other questions. James Goodman says, Chris, uh, thank you for the very helpful presentation. Pleasure, thank you for being here. All right, well, with that, we're gonna wrap it up. And I thank you, Chris. This has been absolutely amazing information. We appreciate your time today. And um, thanks everybody for attending. I hope you found it uh, helpful. All right, have a great day. Right. Goodbye, everybody.